Hello, and welcome to the Invigor Medical Podcast. I'm Natalie Garland, and I'm here with my ever so lovely and growing lovelier by the day oh, thank you. co-host, Derek Berkey. <laughs> Derek Berkey, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my goodness, it's my skincare routine. You know, it I'm is. Like You're not wearing my favorite shirt, but I'm you not. are glowing, and it helps that you remember to turn on the light before yeah. we started recording. Yeah. Natalie this morning was not glowing because I forgot to plug in her <laughs> light, and and that was a no. I have to have the light. <laughs> my favorite part was that you were. I was thinking it was intentional. I'm like, oh, we're going moodier this morning, and then you looked directly at the light and said, "Is this light on?" And I'm like. No, like you're looking right at it. It's absolutely not on. <laughs> I mean, granted, from my angle, it's kind of hard to tell, but that's true. That's Anyways. fair. Okay. Anyway, well, welcome everyone. We have Light, we have Derek, we have myself, and we're super excited to have with us Brett Burton. Um, this is going to be an exciting conversation. It's something that Derek and I don't really know much about, which is unusual because we usually know a lot about everything, and that's why we're the everything. hosts of podcasts. Um, so Brett Burton is here to discuss his journey and mission to help those seeking better health. We're all about that here at Invigor Medical. Uh, Brett has an extensive background in sports medicine, and he's taken that and everything he's learned and built SomaVive. It's a platform that works to help people who have lost hope, whether that be from old age, chronic conditions, or anything in between. He's also a pioneer and advocate for blood flow restriction training, which is what Derek and I are super excited to learn more about, and I hope our listeners are as well. So welcome, Brett. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, it sounds like you have a really incredible story. I know just a little bit about it, but it's really exciting to have you on as a guest um, and share uh, what you've learned and what that learning came from and the experiences in your life. So can you just give us a little introduction of of who you are and what it is that you do? Yeah, so my background is in physical therapy, so I'm a physical therapist. Um, I went to school for athletic training. Uh, my undergrad education was in athletic training. So I was really on a mission to work in pro and collegiate sports. Like that was my goal. And so I studied athletic training. I went to physical therapy school. And then from there, I went to a sports residency. I was like, I need to get in and work with you were all in work with professional teams. And I had a chance to work in semi pro sports up in Boise, Idaho as a part of my sports residency uh, program. So that's really what I was uh, set in and, and focused on. And really would say in that first three years of my career as a therapist and athletic trainer, I was focused on acute care management. So like if an athlete gets hurt on the field, what do we need to do? And then what do we need to do from a rehab standpoint to get this person back to playing, to lifting weights, to doing whatever they need to do? Right. Because you can't have injuries keeping people off the field for a long period of time at that level. No. It's like, that's life. <laughs> no. And I went to undergrad and athletic training to learn how to splint broken bones and to learn how to wow. care for things acutely. But then I went to physical therapy school and I never had a chance to practice those things, I guess. And okay. so I wanted a chance to actually call the ambulance and actually tend to an athlete who was in distress and those things. So that first three years, I would say, of my career was really focused on how do we help people get out of pain? How do we take an athlete who's been injured and how do we get them to back on the field uh, as, as an end goal? Um, mm. And so then kind of the second part of now who I am was I moved to Phoenix, Arizona. So I lived in Phoenix for about six years and worked with a performance company called Exos. Um, Exos was formerly known as Athletes Performance. It's an internationally known uh, performance company that works with professional athletes. We worked with corporate wellness with 25% of uh, Fortune 100 companies. So we were working with uh, wow. high level executives. We were working with professional athletes, but we were also working with uh, corporate executives as well. So, you know, we're seeing folks, um, well, excuse me, I mentioned the corporate executives, but the military personnel. So that was kind of the third arm of the company. Okay. So professional athletes, executives, and military personnel. And from there, I was a therapist at this facility and we worked on kind of rehab to performance is what I would say. So it's not so much managing. How do we manage these injuries on the field? But how do we take somebody who's getting out of pain? Let's say we had a military personnel who injured themselves paratrooping and broke a leg, mm. back, hips, <sighs> etc. So some severe injuries yeah. and they want to get back to 
air team. Jumping out of airplanes Jumping and airplanes. landing on the ground safely. <laughs> yeah, doing David Goggins. <laughs> oh, <it. laughs> intense, intense folks to work. I so loved intense. it. I loved it. It was fun. Yeah, I, I bet. I learned a lot from those folks. Their resiliency and focus to accomplish wow. things is just is, is amazing. And so that second phase, I was really focused on, okay, we've got some high performers here. How do we help this top maybe one to two percent, help them get a little faster, help them get stronger, help mm -hmm. get them out of pain and make sure their body's moving and functioning as well as it needs to, to accomplish jumping out of a plane, tackling mm -hmm. a running back yeah. in the NFL. Uh, maybe it's getting down the soccer field as a college soccer player. So uh, mm -hmm. that was kind of phase two. And then as we'll get into more, I had I, I got cancer uh, when I was there. So that's really where yeah. my uh, story pivots. And I know we'll get into that a little bit later. But the third phase then of, of my career has been really focused on wellness. Like, how do we keep people then well? I, I studied and learned the initial injury process, how do we help people get out of pain? How do we get people performing at a very high level? Now, how do we help keep help, help people stay healthy and how do we help them stay well? And that's really what I've been focused on over the last three years. And so that's a little bit of my background professionally, I guess. So I'm a physical therapist. I'm a performance coach. I'm an athletic trainer with an extensive background in sports medicine. But now we're trying to take these pieces and get them behind people to meet them at whatever phase of life they find themselves in. Where they are. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really incredible because it's easy to think about, you know, people with the extensive amount of knowledge that you have being specifically for high performance folks, you know? And so I love that we said it right there in the bio that your goal is to meet people where they are when they've lost hope, not just because they used to be jumping out of airplanes and landing on the ground and they want to do that again, but because they're recovering from a chronic illness mm -hmm. or they just have never actually ever been able to be active and they feel like, how could I even possibly start? So I love the idea that you've taken all of this knowledge and experience and it sounds like you are are making it more accessible and making it work for people at all stages. And I'm guessing that's how Soma Vibe mm -hmm. was created. Are we getting on the right yes. path? Is this a good place to go next yeah. is tell me about Soma Vibe and yeah. why that started and what it's meant for. Yeah. So Soma Vibe was built out of a cancer center uh, in my own life. Wow. So I was working at Exos, uh, the high performance company and had a random pain in my stomach and ended up figuring out I had uh, cancer and I had testicular cancer. Wow. So uh, uh, some of the cancer had gotten up into my abdomen and it was unusual because in a lot of, let's say, testicular or breast cancers, people will feel a mass or something that's kind of unusual that would sure. alert them. And in my case, there was nothing really to be found. I went to a urologist and he was like, if you were here for a screen, uh, there's nothing really to be found. Uh, but it presented, himself, it presented itself in its stomach with pain and you know, the urologist Therefore said, I'm glad you came in now because the next spot that this heads to is your lungs. So I'm glad you woke up wow. with pain in your stomach and you weren't short of breath or we hadn't gotten up to the lungs uh, at this point. So I went through a couple major surgeries. I uh, went through nine weeks of an intense bout of chemotherapy. And really wow. some of I've started in chemotherapy. I was sitting there getting IV infusions for five hours. And I was just thinking, I was like, man, like there's a lot of people here in this cancer ward that didn't get here overnight. I myself ended up there overnight, unfortunately, but there's a lot of people that I was interacting with and meeting and, you know, oh, I did this to myself or I should have been doing X, Y, or Z and like kind of this dismal uh, mood or culture there. And I was like, man, mm. there's a lot of people out there. I don't want to see people get to this point. Like, what do we need to do to help people get on top of things early, right? Before this becomes a reality in a cancer center. And yeah. so that's really where a lot of the initial seeds were planted. And then, um, after I was transitioning out of Exos, it was interesting because I had, I love sports and I loved working that environment. But after I got out of this cancer experience, I got back there and it just didn't feel like a place I was supposed to be. I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. And I didn't know. I didn't know. I was just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm recovering. The cancer's out of my body. My wife had had our first baby actually at the time too. 
Um, so, you know, you're a new dad. And That's a lot to be going through all at once. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, it, it was. And, you know, we kind of uh, can look back at, uh, light, look at it lightly a little bit now and say like, oh, in that year, we really experienced more than some people ever experienced in their life, potentially, of having yeah, a child no going yeah. through cancer. And so Soma Vive really was, that was step one, was just like, I have cancer out of my body now what do I need to get myself right? My doctor's like, Hey Brett, you're good. And you've got your cancer free. And I'm like, I don't feel great, but okay. I'm, I'm yeah. good. And my oncologist was amazing. I, I really appreciated all the work that she did and she helped me tremendously, but I was just looking for more, I guess. And saying, man, there's gotta be, I was playing with my three month old in the backyard and I was like, I'm out of breath, like kind of on my hands and knees yeah. playing with my child. Like, I've got a ways to go to get myself right. I don't think physical therapy is the answer. Um, I need more than a six to eight week physical therapy program to get myself right. I need more than just mm -hmm. a gym membership to, you know, go into a gym and maybe run on a treadmill or lift some weights. I need more than that. So really some of I've, uh, it was built out of necessity for myself. And it took about three years, honestly, to put myself on a pathway to regaining strength, function, and ability to perform after going through that. So that's kind of where mm. it all began. You know, I think that that is such a striking story, mm -hmm. um, especially your, your insights when you're sitting in the cancer ward and looking at all these other patients and thinking like, man, this, this didn't happen overnight. Like, and, and that kind of a question that I have from that is, you know, in, in our medicine, as we know it right now, it's kind of a often called like health 2.0. Right. Um, but as we know it, it's very, it's very like, okay, what's the problem? Fix the problem with the medicine. Okay, you're good to go and you're out. Mm -hmm. That's very different than your vision. And you, you touched on this already a little bit, but like your vision of wellness, of, of like holistic wellness. Um, can you maybe dive into your insights of like the differences of medicine and wellness and like why we're kind of going through this current divide between, you know, it's a very dichotomous kind of situation that we're in between these two, uh, two situations. Yeah, that's a great observation. And it's something that very much needs to be addressed. And I'd like to break it out really in two points. So you address point number one, traditional medicine, a lot of times helps diagnose and treat a condition. And in cancer, especially the top goal is to keep somebody alive, right? We don't want, yeah. we want to preserve yeah. a life. We want to keep somebody alive. And that's, that was very evident in my care. I mean, it was amazing. The care I got was spectacular. I mean, I went from having this sensation in my stomach to having two procedures and initiating chemo in less than a month. <laughs> I mean, wow. that was, that was a quick turnaround wow. time. Now I was in a large, I was no in kidding. Phoenix. I was in a large metro area, right. With a lot of skilled professionals and specialty centers and those sorts of things. Uh, but that was phenomenal. I was amazed. I was like, wow. And, and you had to blink. And I, I personally had to take a step back a few times. I'd just be like, man, is this really happening? Like it was happening so fast. And so step number one is we, we do need, it's important to diagnose and to treat things and to figure out what's going on. Uh, but then step number two is once we figure out what's going on, how do we make sure the body is functioning at an optimal level. I'm not just here to survive and to live and breathe and move, but I want to go on runs. I want to play with my kids. I want to go on vacation. I want to get together and do things with my friends. Like I want to do those things. Have a quality of exactly. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that I think is where we're at when you talk about this divide is like there's uh, in medicine, it's do no harm and it's keep people living and it's take care of the immediate addressable concern. In wellness, we're talking about people thriving, people living life to the fullest and people maximizing their potential. So those are two very different things, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. I was thinking when you were telling the story, um, it's, I think it's really wonderful that you've been there 
Because I think a lot of people, even if it's just an, you know, let's talk about getting fit, getting in shape, losing weight, whatever, and they're looking at influence on influencers on Instagram or learning from trainers, et cetera. And sometimes it's really hard because, you know, to look at this person, it's like literally been their whole life for forever. They've never experienced what it is to be a hundred pounds overweight mm-hmm. and to try to get healthy, you know? And so there's, there's a lack of an, an ability to empathize. It's not yeah. because these people are- Or pregnant. Yeah. 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 These people are jerks. It's just because you, you know, it's really difficult to empathize with the struggles that that person may be going through in that situation. So to know that you had gotten to a place where you just really didn't feel like yourself at all. And you're struggling to play with your think, I think you said your six month old in the backyard, who's like literally, literally not even running yet. And you're out of breath, you know? Um, and I can, I can only imagine all of the other changes that you went through physically and mentally and even emotionally at that time. Um, to now take all that and to say, hey, I've been there and there is a way forward. I think it, it inspires a lot of hope and probably gives people a feeling of, oh, I can do this yeah. because Brett did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was yeah, the first time, definitely. I mean, just to speak to that, that was the first time in my life that I had felt like weak and unable to do what I needed mm-hmm. to do. You know, I was 30 years old when this had happened. I was strong. I exercised regularly. I you know, I ate well, I was doing for the most part. Still in the prime the, of life. The yeah. Right things. And that's just not something you expect, right? At 30 to have a doctor tell you, boy, you got cancer. And so yeah. that, you know, in itself, but you're right. The sense of empathy that now I have when I see a patient in the physical therapy clinic or when I'm working with somebody through our online platform, through Soma Vibe, I, I don't like, I personally don't like to, you know, put on the tag of like cancer survivor a lot because that's not my identity. Like I, I'm, I want to be a healthy Mm -hmm. person. Like that's the identity that I want to take on and bear. I don't want to be latched or strapped to this cancer that I've now moved beyond and hopefully I'll have moved beyond it Mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. But I want to remove that or forget about some of those things. But yet I ask and I kind of try to remind myself to say, boy, I don't want to forget what I felt like, right? I don't want to forget what I felt like in the cancer ward when I lost 25 pounds and I felt so weak and I couldn't do just some basic things that I needed to do. Like it was very humbling to, I couldn't work my job as a physical therapist. I was a full-time patient essentially for five months because when I started chemo, I got a neuropathy into my fingers and I had to use paper plates in the kitchen because I was concerned I was going to be dropping dishes. My wife wouldn't have been happy about that, but I'm like, I can't be managing, I can't (laughs) be managing people's limbs after surgery and different things if I can't even manage a plate in the kitchen. Um, So it's interesting because I try to regularly remind myself of what I felt like each time I see patients or I work with our clients, because if you can put yourself in those people's shoes and we never can live, you know, I can't put myself in your shoes. You can't fully put yourself in my shoes, but if we can start to try to get ourselves a little bit closer, I think that just completely changes dynamics with how care is delivered. Definitely. Totally agree. You know, uh, and a story that uh, just came up into my mind. Uh, I don't know if either of you have had the chance to read Peter Atia's book, Outlive, mm-hmm. or if Mm-mm. you've heard of it. Um, but he it's a fantastic book. Uh, he has his own podcast, The Drive, where he talks about lifestyle, lifespan and health span and all the things to optimize that. But at the very beginning of the book, he talks about, he makes an observation about the health system in general. And he's like, it's similar to, you know, you're next to the skyscraper and eggs keep falling from the top of the skyscraper and they keep splatting and we're very good at like, we have these baskets that have like pillows and we're able to catch the (laughs) eggs and we're able to anticipate where they're going to go. We've gotten very good at that. But he's like, really the best thing for you to do in that situation is go to the top of the building, find out who's throwing those (laughs) eggs off the building and and get them to stop throwing those (laughs) eggs. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that this, this whole idea of what you're doing here with Soma Vibe, It's like you're going to the top of this building. You're like, I'm going to find out who's responsible (laughs) for throwing all these eggs and I'm going to get down to the bottom of this. And so like, uh, I would love to dive more into like some specific Mm -hmm. tools because, um, in preparation for this episode, we, we listened to one that you did and I know you talked a lot about like James Clear Mm -hmm. and his, uh, book atomic habits and very much like the identity, like, and, and when you're talking about your identity is you want to identify as a healthy person. 
and the power that can come from that. I, I would love to hear more of your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So that's a big challenge. And so I kind of, I guess, speaking to Soma Vibe, we take a lot of folks into our platform who are riddled with uncurable chronic conditions that don't have a pharmaceutical solution, uh, many of them. So some of these folks, they might even be undiagnosed. Like, um, you know, I've been working with a woman for a while that they're, they, she's been two, three years in, and we're still trying to figure out what, what is that diagnosis, right? That she's trying to look yeah. for and find. Uh, but what was interesting is we've served a lot of people with muscle wasting conditions. So that presentation you're talking about, Derek, was for a, what's called a myositis uh, organization that was called Myositis Support and Understanding. So myositis is a, a muscle wasting condition that there's several subsets mm -hmm. to myositis, but these people, unfortunately, it's an autoimmune condition. So their body is attacking the muscle cells. And unfortunately, over 10 to 15 years time in folks with one condition uh, specifically, it's called inclusion body myositis, it's IBM is how it's abbreviated. Unfortunately, a lot of these people end up in a wheelchair because they lose strength in their thigh muscles and their forearm That's muscles. That's terrible. Um, so these individuals, I would say specifically with IBM, have been important players in actually building some of IVE because I connected with my first one down in Phoenix. And what we did is we implemented the blood flow restriction training that we're going to be talking about. And mm -hmm. this gentleman uh, went to Johns Hopkins, which is a top specialty center in the world for inclusion body myositis. And uh, he had recently gotten back from a conference and heard about BFR, like you guys uh, have recently heard about. He just said, I don't know much about this, but I heard you're the guy that teaches this stuff. And I had actually um, been instructed by Dr. Jim Stray Gunnarsson and B Strong. So B Strong is a company that makes and manufactures uh, BFR bands. There's a lot of different equipment makers out there. Um, but I was getting ready to launch my teaching company when I got diagnosed with cancer. So all that kind of got put on the back burner. And then I got healthy enough to start teaching. And I was traveling the country after my cancer episode teaching about BFR. And this gentleman came to me with this muscle wasting condition. And he said, I think that this can help me. I went to this conference, they talked about it, and I just don't know how to do it. You're the guy that's teaching folks about it. Is there a way that you would be willing to work with me? And I said, oh, I don't, I've never heard of this condition. Honestly, as a therapist, I've been practicing for, <laughs> oh, this would have been five years at this point in time, and I never seen a patient that had this. So I said, well, let me do a little research and like, let's see what we can do. And uh, about two months in, we put him on a BFR program with exercise using the bands. And about two months in, he comes back and he said, hey, Brett, like, I probably should have told you this before, but I was a part of a study at Johns Hopkins and they've kind of been monitoring me. And I was like, oh, really? And he said, Whoa. I went and did the testing as a part of this follow up and I got better <laughs> is what he said. Wow. And uh He's like, <sighs> that's how wild shocking. to find out you're like accidentally a part and of a study at Johns look, Hopkins. Yeah, look, like, wow. just, just happened to be, you're you know. Like... <laughs> looking back on it, I was like, we shouldn't even started this. If you were enrolled in this trial, yeah. like we probably yeah. messed something up there. But he was like, I was completely naive and just oblivious to the whole thing. I was like, well, this is what we would do with an athlete. Like if we had an athlete in here that was weak mm -hmm. and was struggling, this is what we would do. And he did it for two months and he showed improvement and progress, which is kind of unheard of in this muscle wasting. We should yeah. be gradually seeing. Because it's yep, degenerative, We right? should gradually right. be seeing people yeah. get weaker. And so wow. that led to me connecting with folks uh, there and them just saying, hey, like, this isn't something we would typically see. And I was like, well, I'm, I don't know. We just did this. I don't know a whole lot about this condition. And here's sure. what happened. Like, this is great. Like the gentleman can walk faster. He can get out of a chair a little easier. His wife's noticing some improvements and just how he's getting around the house. And I was like, awesome. And so, um, you know, that's an interesting start of really how some of I've started to grow with working with these folks with muscle wasting conditions, because what we're seeing with these BFR bands is that we can access and tap into muscle fiber types, let's say type two fibers. So if we're getting into a little bit of muscle physiology, we would have type one. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah, let's, 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 dive let's right talk in. about it. <laughs> so uh, typically we have type one and type two fibers. So type one are your slow twitch fibers, maybe that people would have 
heard about. These are fibers that are primarily activated when we're doing longer distance duration types of activities. Type 2 fibers are really important for explosive speed and power related functions, you know, moving quickly or lifting heavy things. That's typically when we stimulate type 2 fibers. And so, you know, we were talking about in as part of kind of a brainstorming session, like why are these people with muscle wasting conditions potentially showing progress, right, when they're not typically getting better? And one of the interesting things with BFR is we can put these bands on either the arms or legs as somebody begins to exercise, and we can make that exercise very challenging for somebody without having to load up a bar really heavy to make it hard to mm -hmm. lift or without having to move quickly. So in this gentleman's case, he was at kind of a fall risk. He was a little unsteady on his feet, so we probably shouldn't be moving things quickly. And if we're lifting things heavy, we don't want it to get hurt, right? Because um, he's maybe not mm -hmm. strong enough to handle even, let's say, 135 pounds on a, on a barbell. And so with BFR, we can put bands on and we manipulate or change the characteristics of blood flow as it moves through the limb. So we're not cutting it off completely like we would with like a tourniquet or if you get your blood pressure taken. We're just sure. lowering blood flow down as it's moving through the limb. And because the speed of blood flow is slowed down, the delivery of nutrition to your muscle becomes hindered because of this band is here in mm -hmm. place. And so the body then starts to send a message to the brain and says, boy, I'm having a hard time moving my limb here because I'm not getting as much nutrition as I'm, as I'm used to. And so the brain's going to say, "Uh oh, we need to kick in some help. So here comes our type two fibers uh, that are very important and powerful mm. to help mm. my body complete said task, let's say, of doing a bicep curl, just for an example. And in this gentleman who's got a muscle wasting condition, we can start tapping into type two fibers with just simply having him sit and stand out of a chair without wow. having to That's load incredible. up a lot of weight on him. And if, if we look at this, not only in muscle wasting, but also let's um, look at sarcopenia. So that's muscle loss with just aging. Uh, you and I, we're all experiencing this. If we're all over 30, we're all experiencing. We don't have to talk about it. I'm still 29. <laughs> yes. That's why you're glowing, Derek. <laughs> uh, we're, all, we're all experiencing muscle loss. And when we look at the research, it shows that as we get into our 50s and 60s, a greater proportion portion of that muscle loss is in these type two fibers. So if I can stimulate these in a very efficient way that is productive, boy, I might be able to start doing some activities or things like in this gentleman's case that he was unable to do before because it might have been decades since he'd stimulated his type two fibers. That is absolutely incredible. So mm -hmm. I'm very yeah. curious about this whole blood flow restriction yeah. process, right? Obviously it has therapeutic, uh, applications, right? It's helped this guy, uh, you know, who unintentionally skewed the results for the John Hopkins. <laughs> I mean, but like really the, if, if it is going to get skewed, those, those are the, those are, those are the results that we want to, right. to, it's to improving. Skew. Look exactly. into it, John's Hopkins. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but so I'm listening to this just kind of from my own point of view, right? So I, I train, uh, pretty frequently. I go to the gym, I do weights, all that kind of thing. And I'm sure that a lot of people in our audience, probably are listening to this and is like, okay, so how can I utilize this technology? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, so when you, when you put the blood flow restriction, obviously it doesn't completely cut off the circulation. Like how does it increase the stimulus of type two fibers? Is it time under tension? Is it just inc increasing the amount of pressure? Cause there's more blood in there that doesn't have the ability to flow. Like how, how does that work? And like for people, people like me that are just wanting to optimize the results at the gym, like, how could that potentially help them? And for those of you that are listening and not watching, Brett has yeah. now taken the band and placed it on his upper left bicep. I think we're about to get a demonstration, folks, so you might want to switch to the YouTube version of this. This is going to be exciting. <laughs> we'll do our best to audio dub over what he's doing. <laughs> put the bands around the elbow or yeah. the wrist. There's too many sensitive neurological structures or vascular bundles here. Here, we've got a lot of tissue that we can okay. work with. Uh, to keep ourselves safe as we start to do the training. So this is Be Strong system. Mm -hmm. And if with Be Strong, if I pump my pump up here, this would just be like pumping up a blood pressure cuff. Um, I'm going to pump to a, a starting pressure. Now, the pressures, again, are going to vary, depend upon people's, the size of their limbs, their health status. There's, there's several things that mm -hmm. kind of factor into what pressures uh, we would recommend people begin with. But 
I put pressure into the band and what you can see is that now that's detached and I can start to move and lift and exercise. So Derek, in your case, if you wanted to, you could do this at your house or you could do it at the gym. You could do it in your backyard. You could do it in your bedroom. You could do it in the hotel room. You can do it at the airport. Like there's all sorts of places you can exercise with this because I really don't need to have a whole lot of equipment. With BFR, one of the common threads, regardless of what type of methodology or system you're using, is we use high repetitions and we use mm. low weights. So light weights, high repetition. And when you're asking how do we kind of tap into these type two fibers, as the oxygen starts to become less available to my muscle to function, what happens is my muscle actually will send my brain a signal and the brain will actually send a stronger stimulus distally or to, yep, through the nervous system. So we're stimulating the central nervous system to say, hey, we need some help here to execute our exercise. Through the nervous system. And mm -hmm. what that does is it's sending a stronger stimulus that then will tap into these muscle fiber types that are present and available, but yet usually don't kick on until... I really need some help, right, to lift something heavy or uh, do a task that seems a little bit more strenuous. So I can leave this band on, and I don't know if I hold my hand up there, if you can start to see a little mm -hmm. bit, but you can see that I do get some of the pooling into my capillary beds. So this is normal. Yep, this is normal. And if I push mm -hmm. into the pad of my hand there, if yeah. you can see sure. that, I'm still getting blood flow coming back into mm -hmm. my hand. So if I was completely cutting off that blood supply, that would just stay white. I push into the pad of my hand, that would just stay white. But you can see that that turns back to a red color. So I'm not cutting blood flow completely off this limb. I'm slowing blood flow down as it goes through my extremity. The pooling factor starts to uh, mm -hmm. make my muscles feel tight and swollen like you would feel, right, if you're getting a muscle pump in the gym by lifting a heavier weight. And then we have this signaling that actually goes to the brain and the brain becomes very involved in this process, too. So mm -hmm. there's a lot kind of that's happening behind the scenes with BFR. But one simple way that we can look at it is we're putting metabolic stress. So we're, we're putting stress on the body through means of blood flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can get all the way down to a cellular level with this, with um, even like stimulating some of the building to like, blocks like for like protein synthesis. Like, so how it, we actually it, build the muscle and size well? and stimulate some of those pathways. Those can be stimulated through wow. BFR, but they're stimulated not necessarily from putting more weight on the bar, but by manipulating or changing mm -hmm. the characteristics of blood flow through my body. That okay. is so incredible. I want to kind of connect some dots here because there's a lot of information here. So like, I, I, if you, if you leave me to my own devices, I just nerd out and yeah, yeah. everyone else would. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. So I can dumb things down a little bit when all the very smart people are around me. Um, okay. So this is what I'm hearing. Cause we're talking about type one muscle and type two muscle. you got the slow twitch and the fast twitch, right? And so, Say, for example, me. So I'm a single mom. I have a really busy schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to get into the gym to do a bigger lift, especially if it's a leg yes. day, because I can work out at home and I have some hand weights yes. and bands and all that stuff. But it's just really not the same pump. So for anything, it's like I want to be in the gym for leg day so I can get those heavier weights, right? But what I'm hearing is it's like, oh my gosh, I'm traveling or I'm at mm -hmm. home. I don't have the time, you know, to get into the gym in the morning when the kids are sleeping. I have to do this at home. And so normally I would just like use my hand weights, do as many reps as possible, try to like get that burnout. What I'm hearing you say is in that instance, I'm using that type one muscle more because it's 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 not the power, it's not requiring quite as much, or I might have to do quite a lot more reps in order to start activating that type two muscle. So by doing BFR, yeah, you're, you're tracking you're tracking very well. And I think to continue to help your understanding is if you're at home lifting with your lighter weights and bands, it takes you a lot of work, right, to reach a fatiguing okay. point to where you maybe can't do too many more reps, right? If we're talking about training to fatigue, where I maybe have two to three to four reps left in the tank, like with a bicep mm -hmm. curl, yep, reps in a reserve, exactly, Derek. So what BFR does is it lowers the ceiling down to say, hey, we can do 20 minutes of or exercise instead of having yeah. to do 60 minutes. Let's do 20 minutes. Let's change the characteristics of blood flow moving through the limb, and let's make it easier to reach that point of fatigue and allow you to get there faster. 
I'm geeking out right I now. I am like, how I did I not know right about now. this? Oh I know. God. I'm like sweating a okay. little bit thinking about the possibility. <laughs> That's a weird response, I so, realize. But maybe it's because we're talking about exercise. I've, I've got more questions. And it's just because like I am insanely curious about this whole process. So like um, regardless of whether you're you're using it for therapeutic uh, uh, purposes or if you are doing it to to look good and to, you know, get the pump and do all that and uh, – maybe this is just a quick answer and maybe it's a, there's a longer explanation to this and, and you've already kind of covered this to a certain degree, but is it, when you say there's greater stimulus from the brain, is that specifically hypertrophic stimulus or in other words, like stimulus to make your muscles grow bigger? Yes. Is, is yep, that correct? Yep. So, and you know, if you look at a lot of work, I mean, I appreciate uh, Chris Beardsley is a gentleman who's written a lot on uh, hypertrophy. Uh, he runs a great website called strength and conditioning research.com. And he's got a nice little, it's, talk about a good bang for your buck. He's got like a $3 book on Amazon that if you're interested in like the current updates on the mechanisms of hypertrophy, it's a, it's amazing read, but we'll link yeah, it below. But, uh, in Chris yeah. Beardsley's book, really, he kind of comes down to and says like, really it comes down to mechanical tension. It, it's, it's a tension that's placed on the muscle that is needed to allow it to get larger and to improve in strength and function. So it, Chris Beardsley's book really explains a lot of these theories. And it seems like as of late, like that's what it's coming down to. So, you know, are we getting the stimulus with the BFR? We're still putting tension on the muscle as I begin to exercise. And because I have that light weight or even like down here in my little studio, I've got a TRX uh, that, you know, if I'm using a body weight exercise great. or light bands, I still get that mechanical tension on my muscle. But it allows BFR really allows you to settle into like that deep fatigue state for like a long period of time, yeah. if that makes sense. Uh, so I'm still getting a typical stress on my muscle that Natalie would get in her home routine, but she has to get a lot of reps, right, to get there. Or if we go to the gym, I got to load up the bar with some substantial weight to be able to get there. That can be, be dangerous. dangerous. But the mm -hmm. other thing that is awesome about BFR is like, let's just use a push up, for example. If I put those bands on, I got down and did a push up, man, I can get into that deep fatigue state for maybe like 10 to 15 reps where I am really feeling myself work through it. Versus if I go to the gym and let's say I put 175 on a bar, I might only have that deep fatigue load on for like, maybe five seconds, 10 seconds, maybe for a few reps. Right. Uh, so the length of time that I can allow my body to like work and practice and train under this fatigue state is incredible. I, I cannot find another yeah. option that allows I mean, you to do that. To be honest, like that's part of the reason why it's so exciting. Cause it's like everyone goes to the, you, like, well, like more so like you go to the gym and it's, you, you know, that you're going to be there for set amount of time and you need to rest X amount of minutes between each rep. And then you're like, okay. Uh, and you, and you know, like if you're, if you're doing that and you're just resigned to the, to the length of time that you're doing it. But if it sounds like BFR could potentially like, um, help shorten the length of workouts because you're able to get to failure or to fatigue much more quickly uh, without necessarily losing the quality of your workout, but drastically dro uh, dropping the quantity of time that you're spending on that correct. workout. Is that yeah. correct? So I'll give you an example. We That's had amazing. a gal who was a competitive power lifter come to one of our educational courses. So I teach, teach BFR. Um, she was a, a participant in our course and she was out of her gym due to COVID for about three months because uh, she couldn't get into her gym because of the COVID situation. And she said, Brett, I strictly tra trained BFR for three months. And she's like, I did it in the comforts of her home without getting under a bar and doing her competitive lifts. And she said, I went back to the gym three months later. She said, I didn't improve, but I maintained my one rep maxes. After, that is incredible. Three, wow. That yeah. is incredible. Oh my God. I don't think I've ever seen Derek so excited before. I, I'm, I'm just I'm so stoked. I am so, so stoked. Excited. Well, I've, I've just got a question. Like, if you, don't, if you don't take over, Natalie, I'm just going to ask question <laughs> no, after no, question after fantastic. question. I, am I love so stoked seeing about you this. so happy. I'm here for you. I'm excited too, but you are really excited. Yeah. And I, it's so cool. Well, it's, I, I just want to see go ahead. Yeah. to Natalie's situation too. So, Natalie, I've got three boys. Um, 
and we love yeah. to exercise together. I mean, the boys, they, they're, my oldest are five and three. So they're still, you know, quite, quite young. And the youngest one's oh, 16, so 17 months. And uh, we come down here, we're down here in the basement. And, uh, you know, there are days that I just don't have time because of situations. Mm -hmm. But if I can come down here and get on the TRX with the BF work and feel like I've been to the gym uh, that morning. And what we're seeing in some of I've, I think through our online platform. Yeah. So some of I've really, we deliver structured individualized BFR programming to whoever wants to uh, participate. And so we see on average, we see about 600 of these sessions come through our platform every month. So we're seeing a lot of BFR exercises come through the platform and the beautiful thing about tracking wow. folks that participate in our programs is the ability to be consistent with exercise is amazing. And that's one of the key features that people struggle with when it comes to workout routines and regimens. Yeah. So going back to your situation, I think it's, it's like, hey, what Natalie, are you if stick you with? could do two days a week for 20 minutes, like, could you give me two days a week, uh, 20 minutes with the BFR bands? We could see, we can see tangible change Easily. with Easily. more strength and function. That's crazy because I think about, because the biggest thing for me is I like getting my workout in in the morning um, because at the end of the day, it feels like one more thing I have to squeeze in when I, and, and it's really about the mental fortitude at that point because I've been working, I've been talking to people, you know, I'm in sales, I'm on the podcast. So like my whole day is engaging with people. So by the time I get home, my brain's just ready to be like, Fump. and now I have to think about finding my workout clothes and wearing my shoes and get a pair of socks. And do I want to go to the gym or am I going to work out at home? Where's the equipment? Where did I put the damn kettlebell? Is there, you know, am I going to be inside, outside, mood for, there's like all this stuff. And my brain's like, yeah, no. Right. So in the morning, I just feel like the time is so is shorter and shorter. So then I start getting up earlier and earlier, but then I'm tired yeah. and then I have less in the tank the next day, you know? And so it trying to squeeze everything in is really the toughest thing yeah. for me. And so it's like, I'll go and I'll do that 20, 30 minute workout, but there is a small part of me that's like, it's not enough. You know, like I want more out of my workout and I know it's better to still do it than to not, mm -hmm. but I want more out of it. And I, and I, and I have this thing in the back of my mind, if I'm not in the gym, and if I'm not, you know, on leg day doing, you know, front squats with the barbell or doing hip thrusts and doing sumo deadlifts, you know, I'm not going to grow the booty I'm trying to grow. I'm just going <laughs> to say it. I can't do it at home. You know, that's what I'm thinking when I'm at home, like trying to do with the kettlebell or the, the hand weights. Is I'm like, it's never going to get there, you know? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. You don't even know where to begin. I don't, I don't even know. So like, yeah, I'm just like, okay. Okay. So I know I have a question yes, then because yeah, I'm thinking it. about, you're talking about creating these plans for people, mm -hmm. right? And because I'm thinking, okay, if, if, if somebody's like me, if I were just, you know, listening to this podcast um, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I want to try this. And, you know, I think a lot of people that are in the fitness world are uh, really resourceful and are used to going out and getting what they need to try something new and like, oh, I can figure this out. I'll get it on my own. And so I can almost envision people like, I'm going to go buy a resistance band and just wrap it around my arm twice and call it good or whatever. So I guess I would say, what would you say to people who are interested in training BFR or training with BFR, BFR training? Would mm -hmm. we say BFR training? Yeah, BFR training. BFR training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people that are interested in BFR training, um, where should they begin? Uh, you know, because I, I can imagine there's a lot of incorrect and possibly damaging ways to do this, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, you know, how would you caution people like, hey, this is a really wonderful thing. You can see some pretty amazing results, but here's what I want you to not do. And here's what you should do. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a wide range of equipment out there ranging from $40 bands on Amazon to some of the clinical grade range. But there are, I would say, and one thing that's exciting me, I think, about wow. wellness, Derek, if we go back to kind of our conversation about wellness, is there are a lot of these products that we would typically use in a high-level sports medicine center, a physical mm -hmm. therapy clinic, that are becoming more accessible for people to use in the comforts of their home. And that's exciting to me when we look at the future of health and wellness is like, how mm. can we take advantage of some of these incredible technologies and bring them into somebody's home so we can start to use these on a consistent basis, not only do so safely, but also get really good results uh, as well. 
And so with BFR, you know, there's several consumer based models that are out there that are very safe and effective. So I, I, I primarily lean towards Be Strong. That's the one that I've been using for the longest period of time. But we also have other clients in our platform that use uh, what's called Saga Fitness, uh, which is another uh, company name, uh, Katsu, which is the original BFR. And we haven't kind of talked about the history or the origins, but this started in Japan um, through a uh, a concept called katsu and so that's why we have over 20 years of research okay. on this but because it was embedded in japan and it never got out of japan and over to the u.s until probably the last 10 to 15 years or so um that's why it's kind of been late to coming over here so katsu is still out there saga fitness uh be strong there's another company called smart cuffs these uh systems are now being designed for a consumer to safely be able to do bfr without necessarily needing to do every session in their local physical therapy clinic um, but i wouldn't recommend at this point taking a elastic band and you know tightening up around your arm because it really is it really is intricate about that balance right of how do we make sure the <laughs> blood flow is coming into the limb the right amount of pressure and that we're working to a point where we get an appropriate stimulus, the right amount of pressure, right? Improvements and achieve their goals that they're working towards, but it's not. I've done that before with blow drying. I'm like trying somebody, to blow dry my hair. I'm like, Oh my you know, God. Unable to wash so their hair the day they're so, so, from, so with that, you know, uh, doing, you know, over, overdoing it, let's say someone is interested in starting BFR. Um, would they want to go and see a specialist? I, I, I would assume that mm -hmm. there's probably not very many BFR specialists, but I, I could be wrong. But like, would they want to go and see a specialist or it'd be one of these things where like they can kind of like get a gauge of it and kind of figure out, OK, yeah, this feels about right. And they'll be safe kind of within those stipulations. Yeah, I would say if you start with any of those companies, bands that I recommended, um, anyone can purchase those online. You know, there's people that use those independently and they can do those without having to go through necessarily a training course or like extensive education. Um, most actually, a lot of physical therapists are becoming more and more trained on the concepts of BFR. There's several companies out there that are providing appropriate education. Um, so I always say that it's best to start under somebody who's done this before and kind of seen uh, what they can do, even if that's just for a few sessions. I think there's a lot of benefit uh, to that. But once you know what you're supposed to feel, just like with exercise in general, right, it might be helpful to start yeah. with a personal trainer or somebody in the gym who can kind of mm -hmm. show you the lay of the land, make sure you're using the equipment correctly, knowing what you should and shouldn't feel. And then you start to develop confidence and independence, right, with exercise and training and these sorts of things that, yeah, you could elect to continue to work with that trainer or you might decide to go off on your own and continue to utilize those uh, methods and concepts that you were taught. So I do think that those starting, there's um, kind of a, uh, some nuances with it that I think are important, especially if you're somebody that has other health conditions or other things that we mm -hmm. need to be uh, concerned about. I think for most younger healthy individuals, um, it's a very safe training method to execute. But once we start getting to those folks that might be a little older, have several uh, comorbidities or other health conditions that might need to be aware of, that's when you have to really be careful about what you're doing. Definitely. Mm, that makes sense. Are there any specific practices? Because uh, I'm just imagining somebody being like, oh, yeah, more is better. And they go in there and they do a full like as if they're taking a blood pressure and they completely cut off circulation. Like, um, are there any practices that people should avoid when doing this? And like, how do you know when you're overdoing it besides having like extreme muscle soreness mm -hmm. the next day? Yeah. So there's certain things that you should and shouldn't feel with BFR. So for example, like you shouldn't be feeling lightheaded or dizzy. You shouldn't feel nauseous when you're training. You shouldn't get numbness and tingling mm -hmm. into your arm as you're doing that. You shouldn't have pain into like a joint, like your wrist or your elbow as those things are taking place. Um, those would be things that you shouldn't feel when you're going through a BFR session. Uh, normal sensations, though, that you should feel is you should feel some discomfort. You should feel that muscle pump, that burn, that tightness. So those are things the pump. that, <laughs> yeah, that, that people in, in to a certain degree, you know, we've got three folks, I think three or four folks in our platform that are over 80 years old wow. uh, in our platform doing uh, BFR. And, you know, some of those folks, you know, if they didn't grow up exercising, they might not like run to that pump, like maybe a 
five year old is like, oh yeah, like yeah, I like yeah, that yeah, deal, yeah. and I really that that revs me up, and I really like how that feels. Um, but that's the importance that we found in kind of landing on these individualized programs because we can get results and we can help make exercise a sustainable habit for somebody's lifetime with BFR, and that's that's really. I tell people our platform, we, we lead in with BFR because people can get good results. It can happen quickly and we can get really good buy-in uh, talking about like the habits and really nice things of it. Mm-hmm. But my goal for a lot of our clients is how do we start getting you on a train per se of adding another car? So it's like, hey, we got BFR. If I got a train per se, I've got BFR leading out here in front. And I'm, Brett, I'm doing my BFR two times a week and I'm starting to feel good okay, well, let's latch on another car to that and let's get you out now two more times a week. And how about you take your dog for a 20 minute walk? Okay, I can do that. And so now we got our BFR, we got our walking. All right, now I want you to go eat lunch on the patio and get 20 minutes of sunshine each day. Let's latch that car on. And so we use BFR as a engine to power habits Mm. and create change that people are jacked up about and excited about to feel better because our clients will come to me saying, Brett, what else can I do? I'm feeling good now. Instead of me as the coach or the provider saying, you need to get your walk in and you need to do this and you need to do that. We're pointing the finger too many times. There's a Mm. big difference in that versus somebody coming to you and saying, what's next? I'm feeling good and I'm ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's incredible to kind of put the focus on, it goes back to saying like people without hope, how do you give them hope? And especially if there are people that have been feeling like they're stuck in this situation for a long time and or I've been trying this, I tried this diet, I tried this workout, I, I you know, um, all of these things that just feel like failure upon failure upon failure. And I love the idea of let's set them up for a win from the get go. You know, and not just like a perceived win because it could be like, hey, you went five days without a soda. Congrats. Like to a port, it's like, you know, to someone that's feeling really low, it's like, yay me. But there's, I don't, you know, what am I, what is my benefit from this? Like, I, I mean, I feel a little bit better, I guess, but it's not like enough that they're like, oh my God, give me more, you know? So I love this idea of that first vehicle being the BFR that makes such an impact that they're feeling, I, I can only imagine just a whole new fresh perspective and hope for what more they could have when for when before they came to you, they were probably feeling like no hope for anything more ever again. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of folks come to us from, again, some world-class institutions that have sought treatment care at the highest place. Mm-hmm. And for some of these untreatable per se chronic conditions where there's not a pharmaceutical solution or there's not a cure for something like let's just use IBM the inclusion but I just got almost a little depressed myself hearing people say time and time again Brett the doctor said there's nothing I can do there's nothing I can do to help myself out and I don't Mm -hmm. think the doctor was necessarily saying that verbatim but that's what they perceived uh, to say like well I've got this uncurable disease like I'm not going to get it out of my body what can I do to help myself out and I'm just sitting here on the other line saying there's a lot of things that you can do you can do your BFR you can walk your dog you can you know uh, get some sunshine you know you can do these different things and That's the hope that we try to provide to our clients and say, we want to build, um, I call these services, I call them ongoing proactive performance services. I mean, we want to provide weeks in a physical therapy clinic, not just to get to the point where we take on medicine to help yourself feel better, but we want to build these habits for years and potentially decades. We've had some of our clients in our program for up to four years uh, now to where we're continuing. I mean, those those clients, those are the, I, I, I call them the players. Like these people are the players that they are driving some wow. long trains. If we use that analogy where they're like, they're plugging in a lot of things and it's not out of duty, but it's out of ambition to get yeah. better. Well, it's really an upward spiral, right? It's like, once you start seeing like, um, 
you know, uh, in weightlifting, they call it newbie gains, right? Where it's like, man, I'm really seeing the results right now. And like, you feel better. And it's like, you, 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 just like you said, like they, you look for the next thing and mm-hmm. like, what can I do to improve from here? And it's just like, you continue to go up and up and up. And if you can keep that momentum going, man, the incredible impact it can have on people's lives is just amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I did have a question. So obviously you're very much like in this space and you're always looking for, for good solutions. Are there any other kind of technologies that are on your radar that are coming up besides BFR? Because like, I've never even like before this, I've heard about it a little bit and I'm like, well, you know, who knows, but like, <laughs> you've really opened my eyes a lot of like the, the power of this. Is there, is there anything else that you know of um, that's coming up that could potentially have really, or that is promising for, for people that are suffering with chronic conditions or even just the regular Joe Schmo. Yeah, I think what we're seeing is we're seeing products become more accessible to the average person. Uh, so going back to my time at Exos, uh, our headquarters were in Phoenix. We had an amazing facility where we'd have people come across the world. Um, you know, we were probably one of the top 10 gyms. I think at one point in men's health, we were, it was one of the top 10 gyms in the, in the country. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, you know, when I started, it was, you know, over $2,000 for a Norma Tech. If you guys are familiar with like the Norma Tech compression boots or um, mm-hmm. they have mm-hmm. these yeah. different, uh, you know, if you look at like Hyper Ice as a company and Therabody, like those are a couple leaders, I would say, in like the recovery space um, that really have some nice things. And now you can get some of these products for under a thousand dollars, you know, so you don't have to go to the exclusive gym per se to have access and get to those things. You know, people, if they want to prioritize those things, those things are within reach uh, for people to have access to in their home. So I think in general, like those are things, Derek, I'm really excited about. Like when we see these things that are like, boy, that has got a pri- high price tag on it, but now we've seen it get better and it get condensed into a, home-based model and COVID really accelerated a lot of that. Really I think accelerated sure. that, yeah, for sure. with a lot of these companies. You know, one thing that came to mind that I know that uh, we have a mutual context- connection of is uh, Kyle S- uh, Sella. I was thinking that too. And his, uh, the, the ABA AV- cooling device yep. is absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. Uh, like- I was actually thinking that earlier in the conversation of like how cool it would be to like think of these two kind of things that uh, can really amplify your workouts in two, you know, very different ways. They're doing two different things, but like how cool it's like you have uh, the band and you have the, the, um, the Palmer cooling technology for mm-hmm. in between to recover from sets. And I literally was visualizing that. So it's funny yeah. that you were making the same connection. Yeah. You, you know what I'd love as a future episode? is I would love to get you, Brett, and I'd love to get Kyle all on the same thing and have a discussion. Like, I feel like that would be such yeah. a powerful, yeah, really powerful Maybe discussion. Maybe we even do like, a te- we do a test thing where it's like, you and me, we're doing this training, we're using yeah. the Palmer cooling, we do it for 30 days or 60 days or whatever, we come back, we have both of them on, we talk about the plan they put us on. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. I'm open, I'm open yeah. to that. And I think that there's uh, <laughs> a lot there that you know can be said of the AVA cooling uh, device. I have one myself. Mm-hmm. And so when I lived in Phoenix, awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm back in Nebraska now. So I live in my home, I moved back to yeah. my hometown. I brought my family back to my hometown. I have oh, 7,500 people. It's a small town called McC- McCook, Nebraska. It's a beautiful little community where the people, you can't find people uh, like it that are here. Uh, they're so kind <laughs> and generous and friendly. Um, but uh, yeah, when I was in Phoenix, though, I've got the AVA and, you know, trying to get sun exposure, as we were talking about in Phoenix in the summer, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's hot. It's, it's, it's a, 118 yeah, it's degrees. Burden. So what I would do is I would take that AVA and... Uh, take go for my walk. Uh, I would have these different routes that I would use and would do that. And for a future episode, if you want to, I actually did some testing with like a heart rate monitor and some different stuff with that, that, you, you know, you guys might be interested in, but um, it really is a fascinating recovery tool. So I would say BFR helps facil- facilitate performance and making work mm-hmm. or exercise yeah. more efficient. Whereas AVA mm-hmm. is going to help promote some of that recovery. And when you can, get both those things working together. Um, you know, Mark Verstegen, who, who founded Exos, um, when he designed this facility, this gym that I was talking about, he intentionally designed the facility to have two different sides. And you would walk through the doors on one side and it would say work. And the other side would be rest. <laughs> and so 
That's oh. awesome. We had work, work and rest. So on our work side, that was our gym. That was where the music was thumping. And man, it raised the hair on your back of your neck. Like it was awesome place to, <laughs> to go. Like if you just wanted to like feel the environment there, like I would get done with work at the end of the day and I would honestly put on piano ensembles and you know the little different uh mm -hmm. soothing things because i was just like so revved up from the Hyped facility um, but then you go to the other side of this facility and that's where we would have our hot and cold that's where we'd have our massage services that's where we'd have mm -hmm. the, our, our nutrition we had a dining hall there and that was on that side of the facility so the future of wellness i think in getting these things to work together is like how do you take and make work really good and efficient and meet people where they're at. But how do we also enhance our recovery method? So that way the body is healing and recovering and we're keeping people injury free. We're keeping people feeling good and we're keeping people coming back for more. And those things really uh, are exciting. So Kyle's device, I think, is a great one. It's got a nice price point. It's very easy to use, right? Similar to Be Strong and BFR. Mm -hmm. Um, another one that's coming out uh, that's actually just getting launched that uh, if you guys are interested in looking into um, is called Exotherm. It's a, a smart thermal uh, technology. So um, there's some elements of heat. Um, and I, I've been working as kind of an advisor um, with this company for the last two to three years as they've been building this product. And it's actually we're on the doorstep to the official launch date here. Uh, but you can see it online. Yeah. It's, it's Exotherm. X-O-T-H-R-M uh, dot com is how it's spelled. And they have improved uh, the heating experience to make it a digital experience for individuals, which is really unique because so often, you know, we take the rice and put it in the microwave or we go to the physical therapy clinic and they pull out the hot uh, pad out of the hot water mm -hmm. container oh, yep. water. And, yeah i used to do that quite a bit yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> it's a yeah, mess <laughs> yeah there's a lot of nuances and that hasn't been improved for a long time i mean we we, we kind of suspect yeah. suspected in, in kind of looking back on things of maybe 40 years that this has not been improved wow. and so um, that's another technology I'm excited about. I mean, I've kind of had a behind the scenes uh, look, but that product's going to be available here into the fall and winter uh, to purchase for consumers. That's a smart thermal technology. So I think, you know, if you can have a tool in your toolbox per se that helps your performance and you can have a tool mm -hmm. or multiple tools that help with your recovery, I think that's what we all have to evaluate in our, our toolbox to say, hey, what am I using to help myself perform well, maintain my muscle strength, my mass, my function, and what am I helping to keep myself, what am I using to keep myself injury-free, pain-free, keeping myself recovered, and I think if we can fill those buckets with some good items, we can really put ourselves on a nice trajectory to keeping ourselves healthy for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a question, another question, and then we're probably going to have to wrap up, but for anybody that's listening that's really interested in, you know, checking out uh, BFR and getting on a great program, whether it's somebody that just wants to up their game or somebody that needs to start somewhere and needs a win, can they find you at some of I and like, can you like literally get them set up with like, you need to get this and here's the program. Let's have a conversation. Like they can reach out to you and get this you set betcha. up, right? Yeah. So we are at somavive.com. So S O M A V I V E.com. That's our online virtual platform that we serve folks with, with providing individualized BFR programs. Um, so that's uh, that program. Now I would say if there are any physical therapists, chiropractors, those in personal training or wellness fields, um, we do have programs that we educate health and fitness professionals in and delivering BFR effectively oh, awesome. to their clients. And so I travel around the country. Even I mean, I travel around the world. I've, I've, I've been uh, a handful of places teaching and um, that's found at oneharmonicmotion.com. Uh, so it's O-N-E-H-A-R-O-M-O-N-I-C motion.com uh, you know, <laughs> tongue tied there but it's if you look if you google one harmonic motion you'll find our educational services for health and fitness professionals to uh, get trained up on bfr to help them feel confident about educating instructing guiding their clients in in that so you know those are the two places i would say to go to learn more about um, bfr and then for myself linkedin is my preferred platform. So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and I'm uh, fairly active on that platform. Just talking a lot about some of the things that we've talked about today. Awesome. 
Did you have any? I mean, what I am mean, I thinking? I, well, I, I could, did I you could. have any more questions is what I was about to say to him. And then I had to Don't stop open myself. That door. I'm Don't not. Open I, that was, door. I, I started opening that door and then I closed it on my own face. <laughs> <laughs> but we can totally. I love the idea of having Brett on again with Kyle yeah. and having a kind of more fun conversation. I'll be here, but. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be <laughs> stoked. I'll be so ready. I'll be like, have all my questions lined up and be ready to go, man. Oh, my gosh. Brett, this has been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, super fun. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I really hope that that our listeners pay attention and mm-hmm. really uh, look into what we've talked about today. Because I and, and personally, I'm, I'm going to definitely look into it because I think it can really make a huge impact for, for everyone that's listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And thank you for the time and attention and care. And I, and I really appreciate meeting a professional that's in health, fitness and wellness that is making such a beautiful space for people that don't necessarily fit into the category and who have always felt a little bit on the outside when it comes to that. So thank you for making a way for people or building the bridge, I guess I should yeah. say, for people to find a way into health and wellness and fitness and longevity. And I just would encourage anybody who's listening to check out your website to check out uh, Summer Vive because it sounds to me like there's a place for everyone in there. And and I think that that's something that's pretty hard to achieve in this arena. So congratulations and thank you for all yeah, that you do. Thank you both for having me and I've enjoyed my time with you.